All right, here we go, you guys, with the video presentation of the elements of tragedy. All right, you could tell it was, it was late when I was putting this together. All right, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the origins of tragedy and then what we can expect to look for in Romeo and Juliet, a classic dramatic tragedy. All right, it's always good to go back and see where this stuff came from, especially since we know that in the Renaissance, they were looking to the past for inspiration. So they were, uh, once again, they were looking to the Greeks and Romans for models of uh, literature, architecture, art, science, etc., etc. So Greek drama was definitely an inspiration and a model for Renaissance drama. All right, so the performance of tragedy begins in ancient Greece. Uh, tragedy was an art form that uh, was a very popular form of entertainment. Now, the, the first great tragedies um, were likely staged as part of a huge festival known as the City Dionysia or Dionysia. Lots of Greek citizens, uh, Greek men, because women weren't allowed, uh, would gather in uh, these really big amphitheaters to watch tragic plays such as uh, Aeschylus's Orestia. I might be saying that wrong. Um, but there are lots of different Greek tragedies and they have a long and sordid history. Here is a little picture of what one of those amphitheaters might have looked like. Um, sitting here, you could see that, oh, people could see from all over the place to see kind of a, a theater in the, around, in the round. Not just theater happened here, but lots of other forms of entertainment as well. Now, the word tragedy, interestingly, comes from the Greek word uh, tragos, or tragos meaning goat or goat song. That's an interesting word origin. Um, how could the word goat relate to the tragedy of drama? Um, now, it's not totally clear, but there's some pretty good explanations that trace the word to the origins of that Greek festival that we just talked about. Now, the, the city of Dionysia in Greece possibly grew, grew out of earlier fertility festivals, fertility festivals, um, in which plays were performed, so good connection there. At those festivals, a goat would be ritually sacrificed to the, sacrificed to the god of wine, fertility, and crops, and that was Dionysus. Uh, so the idea was that the sacrificial goat would rid the city of its sins. Um, this was related to the later concept in Christianity, Christianity and Judaism, Judeo-Christian, uh, of the, the, the concept of the scapegoat. Some of you may have heard that. Um, so a scapegoat was an animal that you kind of put all of your, your troubles and sins on um, so that you could be absolved. So tragedies may have been a way for people to purge or release sins. Um, so it should be known that this purging, which was often a, often a very emotional experience, was also called catharsis. Catharsis, a nice Greek word. A nice Greek word for, for letting go of negative emotions, often in a very emotional way. And there's our poor goat unsuspecting at the time, of course, who might have been sacrificed to um, rid the city-state of, of its sins and maybe even to provide a bit of catharsis or emotional release. All right. So in modern terms, tragedy is an event causing great suffering, destruction, and distress such as a serious accident, crime, or natural catastrophe. So that's a tragedy. It would be a, an interesting question to jump into. At some other point, is our modern view of tragedies also a form of catharsis? Catharsis. 
Remember that catharsis is a purging or release of emotional tensions, especially through art and music. Again, tragedy might be a way of experiencing catharsis. Catharsis. All right, so we've talked about Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy in the Greek tradition. So many of the elements of tragedy that we see in Shakespeare's time come from the elements of tragedy in Greek drama. No surprise there. Here's some things to look for in Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy. Number one, very most important thing, element number one, the tragic hero. Now, except for the love tragedies, no, Romeo and Juliet is a love tragedy, so we have a little exception here. There's normally just one tragic hero. Now, it can be argued that in some of Shakespeare's plays, we've got more than one tragic hero. Um, for example, in Macbeth, we definitely see Macbeth as a tragic hero. But Lady Macbeth, oh, she has her tragedy as well. So we might be able to find others as well. But normally, only one tragic hero. Keyword normally. The hero is generally a great man or noble man. So this is a person of very high standing, usually a man, um, because in the, the ancient times and in the Renaissance, men were the focus of our explorations, generally speaking. So generally a great and noble man. Now, they're also usually exceptional. So they aren't just ordinary people. Um, they're from a, a high estate or a high class in society, but they also have some traits that make them much higher than the average person. So they might be very intelligent or um, they might have good strategic skills. Um, so they have some other things that make them exceptional. You might sort of think about Odysseus here, very smart guy. He was a king, so he came from a high estate, but he had some traits that made him exceptional among his peers. Tragic heroes contribute to their own destruction by acting on their fatal flaw or flaws. Oftentimes that flaw takes the form of obsession, but it can also be a personality trait such as pride or ambition, but it can also even be a situation or event that has happened to the hero. So something maybe in their family past um, or maybe even a prediction about things. So um, tragic heroes contribute to their own destruction by acting on their fatal flaw or flaws. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Oh, and there is um, a hero, um, Macbeth, suffering the outcome of his fatal flaw. A, a true tragic hero here in Macbeth. Macbeth being a, a, a classic Shakespearean tragedy. Element two, the tragic flaw. So we just talked about how the tragic hero will contribute to his own, uh, his own failings or his own destruction because of his tragic flaw. This is called hamartia in Greek. So in a tragedy, the quality within the tragic hero or heroine, which leads to his or her downfall, is called the hamartia. Now, hamartia is also called the fatal flaw or the tragic flaw, fatal flaw, or tragic flaw. That's the same thing as Hamartia. All right, so we've got a hero with a tragic flaw or flaws. So we're gonna be looking for that in our heroes. In, in Romeo and Juliet, we'll be looking at what is it about our heroes that leads them to do such terrible things to themselves? What leads to their downfalls? All right, the main thing in a tragedy is the tragic story. The tragic story leads up to and includes the death of the hero. So yes, if it's a tragedy, you know that the hero is going to die. Not only the hero though, usually in tragedies, other people die too, 
lots of people die. And in fact, one joke about tragedies is that everybody is dead in the end. That's not completely true, but a, a, often the very important characters uh, end up dying in the end, um, sometimes at their own hands um, and oftentimes, though, at the hands of others. Now, the suffering and calamities, so the bad things that happen to the hero, that befall the hero, are unusual and exceptionally disastrous. So we're talking about murder and betrayal um, and exile and lots of things happening uh, to our heroes that are particularly terrible. So these aren't just, you know, tripping over a crack on the sidewalk. These are terrible things that are happening to our hero. The calamities of tragedy proceed mainly from the actions of humans. So there might be um, natural things that happen or even elements of chance, but mostly the bad things that happen, the bad things that happen in tragedy, they happen because humans do things, say things, mistakes that people make, or conscious decisions that people make. Now, we've talked about this. Shakespeare's tragic heroes are responsible for the calamity of their own falls. They have some kind of responsibility. Often we can find the moral of the story in the things that happen to the hero. Um, often the hero will recognize their responsibility for the calamity, calamity, but it's often too late to prevent their own death. So you'll hear in Romeo and Juliet, you'll hear both Romeo and Juliet talking about the, the, the things that um, are happening to them, but they, but they don't realize that those things are leading to their demise until, well, often it's, it's too late. And sometimes, sometimes our heroes don't figure out what's going on. And here we have um, the death of Hamlet being portrayed. Oh, Hamlet is another classic tragedy, one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. If you have a chance to see Hamlet or read Hamlet, please do. Lots and lots of things going on in Hamlet. All right, so the tragic flaw and the tragic story. Element four, we have the abnormal the supernatural, and then fate, fortune, and chance. And we can see these things as sort of outside influences. Okay, so the abnormal, um, this might take the form of mental illness or insanity or some other sort of mental problems. So the abnormal. The supernatural, we've talked about the supernatural. The supernatural can be things such as the influence of God or the gods or um, ghosts, witches, spirits, that's all the supernatural. And then we have fate, fortune, and chance. Remember that fate can be an outside influence that determines the outcome of events. There can also be chance or fortune, and these things can be related. So in Romeo and Juliet, we're mostly going to see this going on, fate, fortune, and chance. We're not going to say so much on the abnormal and the supernatural, although we might be able to argue this in some cases. So fate, fortune, and chance. Oftentimes fate is referred to in Romeo and Juliet. Um, we might say, we hear Romeo saying, I'm fortune's fool. And we, we read in the prologue that, that there, there are fatal things that are going to happen. That is, things related to fate, this outside influence that maybe our players don't have a lot of choice about. So those um, we're going to see that in Romeo and Juliet. So um, Shakespeare occasionally represents abnormal conditions of the mind, such as insanity or hallucin hallucinations. So um, again, that's the abnormal. We also see the supernatural, such as ghosts and witches. We'll also see our characters refer to God and the influence of God. Oftentimes, the influence of God, fate, fortune, and chance, these things are related. Shakespeare, in most tragedies, allows chance or fate in some form to influence some of the action 
And once again, this is what we're mostly seeing in Romeo and Juliet. And lastly, we have tragic conflicts. And this is when the action of the protagonist or our main tragic hero is motivated by external and internal conflicts. So external conflicts might be things that they don't really have control over, such as things that their parents are doing or things that other characters in the tragedy are doing. But they may also be internal conflicts such as guilt or love or hate. Um, all kinds of uh, internal conflicts that might be playing a role in what happens to our hero. These things all work together. So the external and internal conflicts work together. They lead to complications that cause even further conflicts. So you have this kind of snowballing effect where conflict upon conflict is building um, upon uh, one another and then creating this thing that's just completely out of control and that drives the action toward a tragic resolution and that tragic resolution involves death. Oh you guys up here here's a little picture of the ghost that comes in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So once again we don't have um, ghosts per se that enter the scene in Romeo and Juliet. Mostly what we have in terms of these elements is fate, fortune, and chance. All right, so we've got our uh, the elements of tragedy that we're going to be looking for in Romeo and Juliet. Um, so now you're going to go ahead and take a quiz on the elements of tragedy. Hopefully you've been taking notes. If you have it, go back and uh, look at some of these slides again and get a feel for some of the elements of tragedy. Um, if you've got the elements all written down, element one through five, you should be good. Well, thanks, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys um, later with the next presentation.